I begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salam uh, and salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I am very honored uh, to be with you here today uh, talking about Sufa and uh, Tussa. And uh, just wanted to let you know that I, I am, uh, alhamdulillah, one of a few people who got a uh, graduation from uh, Sufa Islamic Seminary. Sure. It has been started by uh, Dr. Uh, Yusuf Ziakavakchi of INT. He served us as an imam for uh, almost 25 years. Mashallah. And uh, he, one of those long serving imams, alhamdulillah, he had a vision. His vision is that Muslims in this country should uh, thrive soon through institutions. Uh, educational institutions, mosques, uh, schools, and uh, and also institutions that can produce imams, chaplains, uh, leaders for the Muslim Ummah. And, uh, uh, and basically, Sufa was one of those institutions that he was envisioning uh, to, uh, to, to produce alims, uh, to teach classical Islamic sciences like Hadith, Quran, Quran, Hadith, Fiqh, Seerah in Arabic medium, in Arabic medium. And uh, he did that. He taught us uh, many courses in Arabic. And uh, Alhamdulillah, I graduated with a four, four year degree from Sufa. Uh, and uh, it's an institution that requires a lot of. Uh, investment, time, teachers. We, uh, one of the, the biggest things that we needed to do actually is to motivate good teachers to come to teach, motivate good students to come and stay, doing a lot of announcements. That's what made so fast. The, the, Sheikh Yusuf was standing behind it. He was telling the people to come register. He was encouraging young people to join this profession of Imams. He was noticing there is a trend of the community members, you know, wanting their children to go into medical field, uh, engineering fields, but no one really cares about this imams, you know, leaderships, chaplains. We need these kind of uh, people as well. And that was, is lacking. If someone wants to be an imam right now or to learn Islamic sciences, most people, they think to go overseas to get that degree. So the vision was with these institutions, alhamdulillah, right now we have institutions such as Sufa, Tussa, that are trying to fill that gap, basically. And uh, alhamdulillah, now we are struggling uh, at Sufa uh, to maintain this uh, institution and to make it thrive again like it used to be when, uh, during the time of Imam Yusuf. But these are some of the lessons, you know, you have to have consistency outreach, a lot of outreach to the community, a lot of support and uh, good teachers and good students, people who wants to learn. I am very sure there are so many people in our, uh, uh, in our community who wants to learn Arabic. They want to learn, read the Quran. They want to understand the Quran. And we have to have venues for them. And I believe Sufa can serve uh, as one of these venues where people can learn Arabic, they learn Quran. And so this is just briefly uh, some introduction. We are going right now through a phase in which we have to do some maintenance work on Sufa and uh, basically start establish these uh, core subjects in Sufa. Uh, we are not yet at the level where we used to be, where we graduated uh, a class of more than uh, t about 10 people, I would say, uh, for two-year degree in Islamic studies, and then we graduated about four individuals with a BS uh, in uh, uh, Islamic studies. So that is all what I have to say about Sufa, and uh, I would leave the microphone uh, to the next speaker, Dr. Jones. And I'm sorry, I don't have his bio in front of me, so I just wanna... Um, no yeah. problem. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, welcome to this Tissa Talks. Uh, this Tissa Talks was, as uh, uh, Brother Abu Beda pointed out, was organized with Sufa Islamic Seminary. Uh, the inspiration for the Islamic Seminary of America partially came from Sufa 
Islamic Seminary because uh, we met a few times with Dr. Uh, Imam Dr. Uh, Yusuf before he left, and mashallah, he was inspira inspirational. And may we carry on this legacy because he was very, very focused on the idea that if we are to strengthen Islam in this country, we need to educate people right here, right now, and with authentic sources. So may Allah bless Sufa and may he bless this effort called the Islamic Seminary of America. So quickly, I'm, I'm to introduce uh, the Islamic Seminary of America very quickly and also introduce uh, our other panelists. Uh, this is where the, we don't have that whole building. This just remind us this pre-pandemic, this is where we used to have our offices and, and we have to have our classes and we have something called the Center for Ethical Effective Organizational Leadership. Uh, we're in Richardson, Texas, and inshallah, we'll be opening soon. We're not sure how soon. Uh, Allah knows best, but uh, we'll let you know about that. So today we're doing Connecting with Converts, uh, or Reverts, if you will, uh, and uh, it's not tomorrow, it's now. Uh, it's uh, We're going to do this for about an hour, and uh, it's uh, co-sponsored by uh, Sufa. Uh, Embrace, and you're going to meet a representative of Embrace in a moment. In a moment, Rabata, you're going to meet a representative of Rabata in a moment. Uh, and this is uh, this is sort of a reboot of something that we did in July, but a little more focused. And I would invite you to, if you're interested in this topic, whether you are a convert, revert, or a organization, an Islamic center, or a nonprofit organization that wants to strengthen the ability of us to assimilate and make uh, converts, reverts feel more included, uh, get this book, Project Lena, and uh, one of our panelists will be talking about it in a moment and talking about how you can get into it, but make sure you get this book because it's an invaluable resource. It just came out in the past six months. So it's an invaluable resource for anybody who's thinking about you know, how can I be stronger as a new Muslim or any organization that's thinking, of, particularly women, because uh, as you'll, you'll find out that Rabata has been doing some exciting things with workshops around that. So that's what we're doing today, uh, connecting with converts, revert Muslims from our particular perspectives. Uh, about Tissa, our mission is a world constantly better by religious scholarship and ethical leadership. That's what we're about, much like uh, Sufa. And our mission is to cultivate generations of world-class doers and thinkers who lead from an Islamic paradigm while engaging contemporary challenges and opportunities. We call ourselves believing academics and say that you cannot find this kind of education anywhere else in the world. We would put what happens in our classroom up against a Yale University, a Harvard University, Al Azhar. Uh, we would put it up because uh, there's no institution, and I'm familiar with all of these institutions, that connects us to our, our, our roots in a way and confronts the contemporary topics that we, uh, we face in, in the United States and Canada. And uh, if we're going to be strong in this place and in this time, then we, we absolutely must do this thing. So a little bit about, uh, we started in 2019, a couple of years ago. Uh, with 25 students. We have now 46 students and about uh, a third of those students are pursuing degrees, mashallah. And the feedback we, we get from the students is tremendous. About half of them are males, about half of them are females, about half are from Texas, most are from, rest are from around the United States, and a few of them are from Canada. And uh, interestingly, inter interestingly enough, I need to drink, uh, uh, more than about half of them already have a master's degree. In other words, they've already done a master's degree in something else. And uh, now they want to look to the Islamic Seminary of America uh, to nail down that foundation in our usul and while facing contemporary issues. So um, our academic uh, uh, academics are led by uh, uh, Sheikh Dr. Yasser uh, He leads our academic council that meets every other week. Uh, it includes uh, Chaplain Tahara Akmal, Dr. Jonathan Brown, Dr. Tamara Gray from Rabata, and myself. And we have a journal. If anybody wants to read it, all you have to do is Google the Journal of Islamic Faith and Practice. There are two of them free online. If you want to get it in your hand, 
You can go to Amazon and get it for $10, volume one and volume two. It says only says volume one here. And uh, the other thing I wanna tell you about those of you in the Dallas-Fort Worth area is that we did a coping with COVID workshop for Muslim leadership uh, that focuses on how do you deal with crisis? How do you develop yourself professionally? How do you develop yourself organizationally? Inshallah, 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 we're bringing that workshop to the Dallas-Fort Worth area uh, in, in February, in early February. So watch out for that. If you wanna make sure you're on the mailing list, go to the Islamic Seminary, uh, dot US and join our mailing list and you'll be, uh, you'll be uh, get our newsletter when we open uh, the, uh, the competition for that because you don't, you don't just join. Uh, there's, there's a scholarship, uh, there's, uh, there's, there's a stipend that we give in order to do the work. And we're just trying to take what we learn at the graduate level and take it to the streets as it were. And these are the faculty members, Dr. Rania Awad, myself, uh, uh, Professor Benita McGee, and Dr. Tamara Gray. And so uh, if you want more TISA talks, all you have to do is subscribe to uh, the Islamic Seminary of America YouTube channel and you can find us there. Okay, so today we're talking about uh, uh, welcoming uh, or connecting with converts, reverts, and we have a panel that consists of uh, a representative of Embrace, uh, Sister Nahila Morales, and a representative of Rabita, uh, Sister uh, Michelle uh, Sikoski. I'm, I'm gonna let them introduce themselves. Uh, we're gonna start with Embrace, Representative Sister Nahila, and then we're gonna move to Rabita and uh, Project Lena, uh, Daybreak Publishing, uh, Sister Michelle. Uh, and then after they finish, uh, we're gonna let them go back to back. They can talk a little bit about themselves and their presentations. After they finish, we're gonna have a conversation about connecting with converts. So welcome again, Sister Nahila. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you so much, Dr. Jimmy Jones. It's uh, it's such a pleasure to see you and be here with uh, both of you. And uh, it's wonderful to um, reconnect. So I am one of the co-founders of Embrace, a project of IGNA. And so we are, uh, we launched here in the DFW area uh, back in 2017. So we are still in our infancy, but we are growing very rapidly. Alhamdulillah, we have a total of six chapters, uh, Dallas being headquarters. Um, Embrace came about because as a convert, a revert, we wanted to find a place or we wanted to create a safe space where converts and reverts would be able to grow in their spiritual journey uh, through education, but also through their social uh, skills as new, uh, new members of our community. And so uh, Embrace's vision is uh, a comprehensive convert care organization which promotes equality, respect towards Muslim converts to help them grow uh, into leaders and active members of our society. And our mission is to empower um, our converts and reverts um, and to serve the convert community. Um, unfortunately, we have been, uh, we have not been taken care of to full extent um, nationwide. And so it's very important for us to uh, step up to the plate to be able to equip and help one another um, solidify and, and help in this lifetime journey, which is the new way of life of Islam. So Embrace is again, six chapters nationwide, and um, we have paired up and we are working in collaboration with um, Dr. Jimmy Jones and Tisa and Rabata, uh, because we believe uh, that it is how it will work when we, learn to collectively work together, unify the effort, um, and make sure that if I'm not able to help in something, if Embrace doesn't have the tools, perhaps TISA has the tools. And so when we become a solid partnership, then that's when we will see growth. And this is why it's so important for Embrace uh, to be here today uh, with Rabata and TISA, and hopefully, inshallah, many of you will also join this effort. 
Uh, I am very uh, excited to see many of our converts join, inshallah, and um, prosper in their journey. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, Sister Nahila. And so uh, our next uh, panelist, uh, all three of us, by the way, are converts, reverts, in case you didn't figure that out. And, uh, and we come from different, different cultural backgrounds. And we thought this would be a rich conversation, people bringing different perspectives to the table. And so our, uh, our third panelist uh, is Sister Michelle, who's uh, from Rabata and also Daybreak, Daybreak Press. She's an editor there, and she'll talk a little bit about Robert uh, Daybreak, Daybreak Press and uh, Project Lena. Uh, Sister Michelle. Thank you so much, Dr. Jones. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Um, as Dr. Jones said, my name is Michelle. I am representing Robata. If you'd like to find more information about our whole inform our whole organization, you can visit robata.org. R A B A T A dot org, but I am going to come to you about something that falls under our umbrella of our organization. Um, we do serve Muslim women by creating positive cultural change through educational experiences. And one of them is our publishing uh, company, the publishing branch of Daybreak Press. And we came out with a book this year called Project Lena. I do have a copy here in my hand so that you can see it. But I am coming to talk to you a little bit about how this book came about. Um, I myself attended a Project Lena conference in 2013. Um, our founder and chief spirituality officer, Dr. Tamara Gray, when she uh, came back uh, from studying in Syria and she was in the States, she noticed a, a extreme need for converts here. Um, you know, she had been gone studying for the last 20 years and, and coming back, not much has changed. Uh, for the needs of converts in that time. So she developed a conference for convert women only. And this conference, uh, it helped you to bring your whole self to Islam. So this book itself is a taking the conference and putting it into a book. So Dr. Tamara Gray, as long as, as well as her co-author, Najia Maxfield, brought this book to life to help really... Um, give people that connection of, of that conference uh, that they started, you know, way back in, in 2012, 2013. Um, the special thing about this is it's broken up into three modules. So the first module is knowing yourself. Uh, sometimes, you know, before we convert to Islam, we know ourselves very well. And that didn't change. I was Michelle before I converted to Islam and I'm Michelle now after I've converted and bringing that, bringing part of who you are, your roots to who you are as a Muslim, bringing that in is really important. And that's all talked about in the first module. The second module is declaring your independence. Um, as converts, you know, it's our, our duty to study our deen as well, just as any born Muslim. So I would actually go to say that this book is something for everyone, um, but even especially as converts, uh, knowing that you have you have these tools of knowledge for you as well. Um, just even knowing the basic terms and and understanding them is important for us. And then the last uh, module is tending your ties. One uh, struggle as converts that we have sometimes is keeping the ties with our family. And as Muslims, we know that this is very important. This is. Um, something that we have to do as Muslims and and to respect that kinship tie. And this gives some ideas and some, some experience, some life experience talked about in this book. And the other ties that we have are building a new community and new relationships. We're gonna have new friends. We're going to have friends that have different cultures now. I mean, uh, coming to Islam opens you up to all of the Muslims all over the world, right? So tending those ties and finding your community in different ways, um, this book talks about. Another thing that I just wanna to touch on that is different from this book than what we had in the original conferences is the foreword by Carla um, Kavasik. She did her master's in Islamic studies and she did some research around Muslims, uh, Muslim converts and 
you know, when did they convert? Were they married first? Were they single? I mean, it's interesting. I, I encourage you all to buy the book. You can purchase the book at daybreak.robata.org. But her studies really were eye-opening even to myself as a convert. Um, one of the questions asked is when when did you feel like you're Muslim? Like when did that, that come about? And I think that that's um, important. We all have these different steps in our in our conversion so i do want to let you know that you all can purchase this book at daybreak.rabata.org um, we do also offer an online version of the conference and when you can find details of that at register.rabata.org we do not have one currently but you can definitely get registered so that you can be uh, all set uh, to get ready for the next conference. Um, and if you wanna find any other information about us, you can find us online at robata.org for information on our whole organization. Um, I'm so excited to be here. I, like Dr. Jones said, the beauty of us all coming together is we do all come from diverse backgrounds uh, with this panel um, here. And so Dr. Jones, thank you so much for having us. And I'm excited uh, to move forward in the panel, inshallah. Alhamdulillah. So uh, as a bridge to our, our conversation, I think that the first message to uh, to people who out there who are converts, reverts, is the message of the Project Lena, whether you're male or female, right? Know yourself, right? Declare your independence and tend to your ties. That is, uh, the person that you are before you took shahada is still the person in many, many ways. And if we look at the seerah of our beloved Prophet Islam in the early, in the early, uh, uh, Sahaba, we'll, we'll see the same thing. And secondly, declare your independence, in a sense, both within and outside of the Muslim community, your independence in relationship to your, your prior ties and some of them you have to cut, and also within uh, uh, the Muslim community, that I don't have to be like you, even though you were born Muslim. And this is often a little bit of friction between the two. Uh, and third is tending to ties, that is, you know, uh, tending to particularly the family ties, which are very it's important to us as Muslims throughout our lives, no matter where we came from. Again, if we look at the Sira and the early community, this was very, very important, always very important, whether the family was Muslim or not, but also the family ties within the Muslim community at the same time and declaring our independence are, are the kinds of things that we stand up for and make bring our whole authentic self. And so what can Islamic centers do about this is accept this process, right? and understand this process. And hopefully our talk uh, today will give you a better understanding of this so you can build a program, maybe using Project Lena, using the book, uh, uh, Project Lena, or other, some other resources that between Embrace, uh, uh, Rabata, and uh, Islamic Center of America, uh, we are all three very interested in this part and in, in focusing particularly on converts, not just converts, but particularly on converts in this sense, and helping them bring their authentic selves so we can be empowered as a Muslim community here in North America to be strong and forceful and be a force for good, not only amongst the Muslims and, and worldwide. So why don't we just start our discussion if, uh, if both of you will unmute your microphones. Uh, uh, the first question is, as a convert, we and I'll start with Sister Mahila. Uh, do you think that your culture and the culture of the community that you're entering, you were entering, made it either easier or harder for you to feel authentically Muslim? Okay. Um, so coming from a Latina background, mm -hmm. um, Subhanallah, you know, Islam aligns very much so with uh, with a lot of our values and principles. Uh, that I grew up with. Um, and so, you know, being respectful to your elders, being kind to others, taking care of your neighbors, making sure that you are looking out for your neighbors. And a lot of these things did align with it. I think one of the things that was very difficult was entering spaces where it wasn't inclusive. And what I mean by that is, you know, we know in our Islamic tradition that you know, someone speaks um, Arabic and a third person comes in and doesn't speak Arabic, you're supposed to swap to the language of every, of all the individuals. Well, that didn't happen uh, very often. And so I, I did feel sometimes left out in that sense. 
But overall, I think, um, you know, our intentions are well meant by our community and they, they do want to embrace us or welcome us. But culturally, sometimes it doesn't it doesn't go well um, because we may not be dressed like them or look like them or speak like them or eat like them. Right. Um, I personally uh, embrace Islam in a predominant Arab um, mosque in New Jersey. And they were very welcoming. But again, there was a lot of cultural baggage that I was not able to understand early on. And so I always say this with the best intention, and I'm sure you can relate, that I am so blessed and grateful that I found Islam and met Islam for what it was before meeting the Muslims, because I don't think I would have converted otherwise. Um, and again, I mean that with true uh, sincerity uh, and not criticizing or being judgmental, but I think it's something that we need to be um, hold each other accountable and be real, right? We need to talk real talk in order to make sure that our converts and our reverts, you know, don't go through the to the through the um, difficulty that perhaps we went through once upon a time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what I hear you saying is a couple of things. Uh, number one is that, uh, and I, I think it's a minority of people. I think there are a minority of people who are, who are born Muslim who think that people like us are like blank slates that they need to paint on. In other words, that we don't bring anything good from our, in the African-American community the same way. We had some of the same values in the Latino community. And so I was taught some of these things before Islam, mashallah. And so that's one, as you said, one of the reasons that it resonated. And, and the second thing is that, is, is, is that, you know, take the good. I mean, just look at our beloved prophet, Islam. he was known as al -Amin before, right? He brought that into Islam before he got uh, the message. And so we need to remember the, what was happened 1400 years ago and not act like because somebody is from a different cultural background or is entering Islam later than you, that they have to be dealt with as if they're, you know, they don't know anything and their culture doesn't mean anything positive. Uh, Sister Michelle, would you like to follow up on this question? Sure, I think my experience was a bit different um, because I did convert in a small community and the community itself was African-American. So as a white American coming from the same city, it was easy to kind of ease into the experience mm -hmm. because the people that I converted with, the, the women, um, just a little background, like if I go back a little bit, I had studied a little bit about Islam. I was interested, decided I was going to fast as a non-Muslim, and I was quickly embraced um, by the mosque. I decided to break my fasts in, right? This was all a learning experience for me, and I was learning by, you know, by experiencing the fast. I mean, the nice part about this is we broke our fast with like chicken Alfredo. We broke our fast with, you know, hamburgers and fries sometimes. And it was nice to feel welcomed. Now, for me, the culture shock began when I started asking questions of, you know, well, why are, you know, certain people wearing only this? Like, I had a community uh, of sisters around me that were only black, for example, um, taking from different traditions that maybe weren't necessarily their own culture or their own tradition. So this is where the shock started to come from me. And then I continued, you know, just trucking away and I decided it was time I wanted to get married. Looking to get married is also where the culture shock came from me as well. I, I cross-culturally married and um, understanding that, you know, I came from this place where I saw a lot of American Muslims, okay? And then I, I married um, and my first husband was actually Ethiopian. So their culture of, uh, was of Islam, I, I don't want to say their Muslim culture was a lot different than the Muslim culture I had experienced. So that's when my my shock value started to come. I moved away from the community I knew and I entered in a community that was full of, it was such a diverse community, mashallah, but everyone was so divided in their pockets, you know, and this is was something a little bit different from what I understood. So, I mean, I do, I am very grateful um, like uh, Sister Nahela said, is that, you know, we have these experiences that you're grateful for. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he knows what you can handle. And when I came into Islam, I was surrounded by Americans, right? So they came with a, a similar cultural background as mine. Um, and then I had that that learning period before I entered into, it was like a, 
a safe zone and then the doors were open and it was easier for me because my foundation was already established with Muslims that were similar to me. Um, and as I grew, I mean, one of the things I mentioned before is I did attend a Project Lena workshop very early in my conversion. I mean, I was too, I was a Muslim for two years at the time. So, and it happened to be shortly after I got married. So it was like the perfect time. It was like Allah opened the door. Like, okay, you got, you, you're still yourself, even though you're jumping into another culture, you know? So that's where my experience is a little different. And I think we all have that. Um, I think that's something to recognize too. As converts, we're not a monolith. Like look at all of us here and how we all came to Islam in so many different ways. And we're so, we came from different cultures and we have different baggage. So just as all of the cultures within Islam are not a monolith, we aren't either. And I think that that's important too, is that we all come with different knowledge base and a different background. Different passions and different things to bring to the table, right? So, okay. I mean, subhanallah just just look at um subhanallah this panel right here uh we're so diverse right me being mexican you know dr jimmy jones being african-american and yourself um that speaks volumes and i think our community needs to gravitate to that instead of trying to put us all into this basket you know in a in, and put a label reverts converts they all go into a basket as if we all came from the same walks of life absolutely so for myself, I, I uh, joined the community of Imam Wafi Muhammad. That's where I took Shahada, which was an uh, African American community, as you all know. And I was welcomed, mashallah. I was I was welcomed uh, with open arms to this community, uh, partially because uh, the uh, I was I'd come from a black nationalist vibe, and this community came from the nation of Islam, which had a strong black nationalist vibe. So I very much felt at home. Uh, however, I think that uh, the problem is, is that to a large extent, uh, we, we both African Americans and so-called immigrants, because uh, when do you stop being an immigrant, both African and so-called immigrants, that's why I say, uh, people from other places, uh, often uh, see their culture as being better than the other culture. Mm -hmm. and this, is, this is where it becomes, it becomes a problem. And you see that, that divide, we see that divide even now. And I, mashallah, I took you out in 1979 been around for a while, but I, I'm sad to say that I see that so-called immigrant uh, and uh, so-called indigenous, because there are other indigenous people here, divide as one of the shames of Islam, because in the sense that one of the things that our beloved Islam, when one of the last things he said to us in his farewell message, uh, the meaning of which is there's no superior of white or black, or Arab or not Arab, and it's somehow uh, some of us seem to miss that lesson. So uh, may Allah make us amongst those who, who gravitate toward that lesson. Uh, let me just segue to another uh, point. And this goes back to, to leadership uh, and start with you, Sister Michelle, this time. But what do you think mastered leadership? And then that might be uh, some folks at INT and SAFA and other organizations that might be listening. What do you think that mastered leadership can do to help uh, converts, reverts, bring their whole selves to Islam? So um, this I actually found very, um, I was on the board of a masjid in, in Ohio for mm -hmm. almost four years. I just recently moved to Minnesota. And one thing that the founders of this masjid had that I found to be such an opening for converts is the, the board makeup. And I, I do wanna reach out to masjid boards that are consistently the same people you know leading this way what they had is in this board makeup is that no ethnicity can rule the board there's always been ethnic limits um meaning that you know you can't have a full arab board you can't have a full indopak board you can't have a full african board um and also with that being said as well they required at least two members of the board to be born born in america because they were understanding the growing change of Islam in America, mashallah. And this is before, you know, they established these bylaws as the masjid was being built. And they also understood they required two women on the board. Oftentimes, um, and I'm, I know we're talking about converts here, but so many converts are women and so many women are working in the, in the, in the masjid, I think having the people who are doing the work and coming to the masjid, it's important for your board to look similar to what you're, 
your mess massage it look like here in the US, um, oftentimes the disconnect comes from the leadership looking so different. So does this mean I think, oh no, there should never be immigrants on the board? Of course not. Our community is so diverse that I, you know, seeing this makeup and this layout in the bylaws. So as leadership, allow, you know, take those uh, experience and questions from what your community does look like, right? I think that that's super important. Also, one thing that I do find important um, is having a place for converts like Embrace. You know, Embrace is really um, centered around converts, but that's so that they can talk about issues that maybe a born Muslim may not encounter, right? Quickly, one, I mean, one thing, if I go back to my experience, um, the first year that I was Muslim, so many, so many Muslims, and this is including converts, were quickly telling me, oh, no, 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 you cannot, don't go to dinner with your family on, at Christmas, don't do it, don't go to dinner, don't do it, oh my gosh, this is so haram, like, quickly telling me these things, which, granted, if you are a born Muslim, never, like, you have no idea what this holiday is about, I don't encourage you guys don't go buy a Christmas tree. Don't like start celebrating. But if you have family that you want to connect with and going to dinner, um, one of those things that could be could have been very detrimental to my relationship with my family for them to quickly tell me, don't do this. So I, I do think that there are um, it's important to have convert safe spaces with people that really understand the convert community and convert needs. Um, I, you know, that's one thing that I would definitely say, you know, to leadership, a story that always inspires me is of Imam Shafi and how when he went to Egypt, for example, I mean, this is Imam Shafi, come on, he's like, so like knowledgeable, you know, may Allah be pleased with him. He, he came with so much and people were begging him, like, give us, give us a fatwa on this, give us a ruling on this. We need a ruling on this. But he, he said, no, I don't know the norm of your culture. I don't know the norm here and it's not recorded that you know he gave a fatwa anywhere until after he was e in Egypt for a year so as leadership understand what your community needs you know um, give those converts a safe space I mean that that story is one that always carries with me and I look for it as a convert I think wow mashallah this guy that had so much knowledge I mean he could have you know uh just given fatwa every day all day you know but he didn't because that wisdom as well of knowing the community so i encourage leadership to give converts a safe space and give them um you know and it's okay by the way as a leader to say you know i don't know i haven't encountered this situation you know young convert let me check for you you know i think that that's okay too um i mean that i think that's my my biggest thing to offer <laughs> Okay, and so I just want to remind uh, people watching that we will take questions from you. I don't see any in our Q&A box, and I don't see any in the chat. Uh, in, in about five minutes or so, we're going to be doing that. So if you have questions of us about our particular situation, about, you know, how how to, to, to connect with converts or any concerns that you have, please share them with us. Uh, in the meantime, I want to pivot to Sister Nahila and just uh, preface my, uh, going to you by saying that w one of the things that uh, Dr. Sam Bagby, who was the president, who was the former president of TISA, found and he, every 10 years he does uh, a census of the, of the mosque in America, he found two things that should concern us. One is that uh, uh, lots of people are leaving Islam, right? It, it's not news. And, and two, uh, the African American, uh, and particularly amongst African American, African American uh, mosques are declining, and I think that 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 somehow connects to what we're talking about today. Uh, but uh, Sister Nahila, what, how would you approach this issue of giving advice to the leadership of uh, Islamic uh, centers and mosques around how to help people bring their authentic selves to Islam? So, you know, subhanAllah, as you were speaking, the first thing that comes to mind is emotional intelligence, right? We lack that in our communities, in our leadership. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, we, we, we do a lot of lip service and I'm trying to be very gentle with my words, but honestly, it's far past where, you know, you, you see a, a young brother 
walk in with a lot of tattoos and instead of welcoming welcoming him you know he leaves there distraught even though he is struggling himself you know he came to a place to comfort his soul and instead he was you know kind of push and so this is something that we at Embrace try to make sure, and it happens far too often that most of our converts, subhanAllah, come broken from these masajids. Um, and one of, one of our goals is to build them up with the skills they need, empower them, uplift them, in order for them to go back into society, back into this masajid. So we're not, we're not really um, separating. On the contrary, we're hoping that we're able to facilitate everything that that convert needs, that revert, uh, once he's left the masjid, before he leaves altogether, right? Because we have had individuals who have been on the verge of leaving. Like this is their last stop, embrace. Let me check you out and let me see if you are gonna be judgmental, number one, or you're gonna really embrace me like your name. And so one of the things that I see with leadership is the lip service. And uh, this question came about from another convert. Uh, she told me, Nahela, we need to make t-shirts that read something along the lines of, how sincere was your takbir? So we have to remember, right, that day that you embrace that convert. And what makes me, what, what comes to mind is when uh, when somebody embraced Islam in the time of the Prophet Sassam, like the Prophet would go to like connect him with the Ansad and make sure he was taken care of from A to C. And that included how much did that person owe? Was he in debt? Does he have food? Does he, I mean, he just went through this list and we are already shunting people away if they ask, you know, question A and, A and B. So we need to be very mindful, very careful. And again, emotional intelligence needs to kick in almost immediately because we don't know the trauma that each individual comes with. And so they may, they may embrace may be that focal point where it's, they're looking to be saved. And if they come into a community and they finish breaking them, then this is where we see the, the revolving door of so many converts coming in and leaving. Um, and so I guess what I'm trying to say is that our communities, our boards, our, our leadership really needs to be in tune and really needs to recheck their, their bylaws to make sure exactly what Sister Michelle said. I love that board uh, strategy as far as making sure that no two persons could come or no more than two people can come from the same area or what have you. Because again, the, the, American, uh, the American Muslims are completely different than, you know, per se Mexican Muslims, right? They, they deal with different uh, issues. But more so, I would say that we just need to be very compassionate and we're losing a lot of that compassion uh, in our practice uh, among leadership. And, and it, it's just very heartbreaking uh, when, I, when converts come to us and they actually uh, tell us that they were either mistreated or they were basically turned, uh, turned off by A, B or C, you know, whether it's just being judged whether it's just not being helped. Um, we have some converts that have come with um, disabilities, you know, they haven't even taken that into consideration. Mental health is a big one. You can't see who, who has mental health issues. And so we need to equip our leadership with the tools they need to be able to handle everyone in their community. Otherwise they shouldn't be in these positions. Wow. So uh, anybody who knows me knows I'm a bibliophile that I, I really love books. And uh, this is one I discovered, uh, recommended to me by a faculty member. We're teaching a course on the, uh, imams uh, and chaplains. And the, and the book is called Muhammad 11 Leadership Qualities That Changed the World by Nabil El Azami. Uh, and it talks about 11 characteristics that led to the dramatic change in the world based on our beloved because we're always talking about uh, Quran and Hadith, but what, what this author has done is distilled the characteristics of our beloved and so that we, so we can practice them. The other book I would recommend 
uh, is a, a book by Al Umari, A L U M A R Y. It's translated from Arabic into English. It's called the Medinian Society at the time of the Prophet. In other words, and this is a triple IT International Institute of Islamic Thought book. That's a very and both of these are easy reads. I mean, if you if you're working with the high schoolers, if you're working with the general population, or you're working with, with somebody whom English is not their first language, I mean, we should we should take the knowledge that we these are Muslims who've integrated the understanding of uh, our deen with with modern concepts. Okay, so so you've heard you heard quite a bit. By the way, still no questions, so we'll continue. We have about thirteen minutes left. Uh, uh, oops, there's one, uh, and I'll get to it in a moment. Uh, oh, I should, can I type the names and the authors of the book? Uh, well, I'm a one finger typist, so that's not happening. So uh, uh, maybe uh, one of our hosts could do that for me. Uh, the book is Al Umari, A L U M A R I. Uh, and it's a translated book. I've forgotten the translator. And it's Medinian Society at the Time of the Prophet and the Islam. Islam. And the other one is uh, uh, by uh, El Azami, A L A Z A M I, uh, Muhammad and the Islam, 11 Leadership Qualities That Changed the World. So if one of our uh, hosts could uh, do that for me, that would be good because I. I, I'm one of those people who can't walk and chew gum at the same time. So anyway, so we we uh, I want to pivot a little bit uh, because we don't want this whole session to be negative. Uh, <clears throat> could you, uh, Sister Nahela, talk about uh, a very positive experience that you had with Islamic centers uh, when uh, on your journey in becoming quote more authentic? Oh, absolutely. I mean. There is good, obviously, with everything. And let's let's point out that we're far from perfect. Perfection is an attribute of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so uh, that being said, obviously, the intentions are great. Um, I personally come from a very welcoming uh, masjid in New Jersey. And I remember uh, when I came in, one of the first things that I was asked, it was winter, and um, I was asked if my son at the time was one, he's now 16, um, they asked if he had a, a winter coat. And I thought, I mean, that blew me away. I, I was just going there to classes. And I think that's the, those elements, those values, those core values of taking care of one another that drew me more into like that compassion of what really Islam represents, right? I mean, our Quran, every, every verse starts with, uh, um, it starts with um, that he is a Rahman, right? He is the most compassionate. Um, and so for me, that was one of the best uh, experiences that I had. The other one was when I just came to learn about Islam for the first time, the Sheikh that I was learning under, Sheikh Muhammad Al Hayek, I remember I was fidgeting with the hijab. I was so nervous and I was, I was hyperventilating literally. And um, he says, are you here to learn? And I said, yes. And obviously my, my toddler was running around and he's like, it's okay, let him run around. I'm like, okay, but that's not what we're taught. You know, he's supposed to be well put. He's like, he's a child and we just got to welcome them. Uh, the other thing he's like, do you feel comfortable with that thing on your head? And I said, absolutely not. I'm not Muslim. He's like, so take it off. It's okay. You're here to learn. I think those tiny acts is really what drew my heart to learn and understand what the hijab really truly represented and love the hijab for what it is and, and, um, and really love Islam on a whole different level. And, um, you know, I don't see that very often today, but I want to keep it on the on the positive note. I think the other thing that I have seen um, is that there are a lot of people out there. There's a lot of brothers and sisters that mean very well. They just don't have the skills, and perhaps they they can join Tissa and gain these skills and gain uh, the knowledge they need to understand the other. Right? Like I'm reading a book called Leading with Compassion. And it talks about prophetically as well. And it's so wonderful to hear how that emotional intelligence that our beloved Rasulullah mm -hmm. used even during the, um, 
during the peace treaty of Hudia, like just to be able to say, no, we're not going, it's okay, we're gonna turn around. Uh, and at the end, he saved so many lives and, and yet, you know, there was peace. And I think sometimes we don't know how to navigate that. And we just take things either black or white. And so our converts don't understand half of the time because they're on this long, lifetime journey. Uh, so I just think that we, we, we just, again, the word for today, for me, I think it's compassion. We just need okay. to break it down to compassion um and be more compassionate with one another uh is that uh a book by dr louis Sanchez? yes right yes. right he's a friend uh I, I have a pdf of it by the way folks oh know. i have it here right. <laughs> I, I, if you want to yeah. get a pdf of I, it you know you can email yeah, me i love it islamic summary of america yeah it was it's my it's in the same vein as the book that i recommended uh is 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 spelled s-a-f-i is his last name l-o-u L O L U Y, yes, mashallah. I used to be at, at Isna. Uh, Sister Michelle, uh, positive, something positive on your journey. Uh, yeah, um, I mean, for me, I gained a, a group of people, family, in so many different ways that have the same belief. You know, it's one thing that united us is that we we have Tawheed. This is, you know, we we believe in the oneness of Allah and that. You know, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is his messenger. Some of my most fondest um, memories, even now, I've been Muslim 10 years, is uh, pre-COVID at the mosque. Every Friday night, we had family night, family night, and people, we brought food and we all ate together. And I tried food from so many places I probably never would have tried food from. I was accepted as, you know, part there. Um, you know, another thing is like some of my friends, when my grandmother got sick, you know, sent flowers, you know, right away. Um, these are people that I experience life with. And I, I want to encourage any convert that maybe is struggling a little bit with the, some of the cultural differences is even just as friendly as we are as um, Americans, we are very smiley and in your face a little bit. And not every culture is like that. I think sometimes we think, oh my gosh, they're not welcoming, but you know, they like they gave you a gift. They gave you Quran. Maybe their face was straight. You know, it's not the same, uh, the same thing. So I think that we also, as converts, and this is my advice to converts: go in with an open heart and an open mind, because we're merging different cultures. I realized a lot, you know, a lot different too. I spent two years in Egypt, um, which is another great experience. This is all part of my journey. I went to study Quran and Arabic, and even that was a different culture shock for me. You know, and I was welcomed with open arms in a different way. You know, I watched, I watched people fight on the street and then encourage each other, like Salat al Nabi, Salat al Nabi, like yeah. praise the Prophet. It's okay, get over it. You know, and this was a normal thing. Whereas, like, you know, if I watch people fight on the street and in the U.S., it was not going down that way. You know, it's a much different experience, and I'm really happy that you know Islam has opened me to these experiences of different people and different cultures. And you know, I think for me, one of the most positive experiences is I'm able to embrace differences probably a lot easier than I was as a non-Muslim. Um, I'm not saying that I never embraced differences, but I was in my own circle. You know, I was an inner city kid. This is where I grew up. This is what I, I did. And, and this brought me, you know, to a much different uh, space, you know? And, and I will say, once you get past that cultural difference, you'll, you have so much fun experiencing different cultures, different foods. You know, I never thought in my life I would try anything from like any Malay food, never. It's it's yummy. If you like spicy food, you'll love it. So I'm just encouraging you as converts, especially, you know, once you get past that awkward, hello, you know, how are you phase? I think you can really have some great experiences with people that maybe look at the world a little different than you do. So a heads up to Brother Abu Beda. We're going to ask you to do the closing dua in a few minutes. So just a heads up. Okay. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. I have one quick question. Uh, one quick, if you allow me, one one sure. minute to Sister Nahel or anybody, when you, any, any of you too, is uh, we said you said especially uh, about um, uh, a safe space space for converts and uh, and and having uh, uh, different uh, you know multicultural uh, boards. 
uh, uh, what can, like I said, there, there is a couple of institutions that is from, we call Embrace in Dallas, we have something called Ansar Institute, Al Ansar uh, done. So what were they doing different or what were, are not, they not enough or what can the masjid do that uh, the Ansar cannot do or um, what is missing? Uh, because it's a huge engagement if you want to have everybody's, uh, uh, you know, all problems taken care of, uh, it's gonna get difficult. So, um, you know, what kind of thing you really want as a safe space uh, that, that I, I'm in a board member, I want to make sure that your ideas are being uh, discussed in the next board meeting, inshallah. This is Brother Hamid, right? Yes. Alhamdulillah. Uh, who wants to tackle that? Um, uh, um, I, I'll take a shot at it. Oh, there you go. No, go ahead. No, please. <laughs> no, I was going to say, I think that that's it. Uh, Brother Hamid, just you yes. knowing that you want the converts to have a place they can chat. That, I mean, I think that that's the biggest thing. Some of you may have really small communities of converts, mm -hmm. some bigger, but just allowing them that space, right? So maybe have, if you have a convert that you trust in your community already, ask mm -hmm. them, do you want to like lead a little social group? Do you want to have, you know, um, chili dogs and french fries and watch the game? I mean, this is something like, you know, they feel like sometimes you feel like there's two different worlds. Like I, I can't enjoy what I do, like people who know me know I'm a basketball fan. Like this is like part of who I am. Like now it's become like, oh yeah, you're Michelle from Akron, you know, home of LeBron James. Like I know, don't talk about him anymore. <laughs> you know, it's like that that situation. But I think just opening that space, I mean, this is me personally. I think just knowing that it's okay for them to come and bring their culture and and have that space to be themselves. Just like a low item. So I would like to add to that, yes. you know, because I am here and I've uh, made INT my second home. Um, you know, it's very diverse community, mashallah, and I love it. I live literally three minutes away. My son goes to school there mm -hmm. um, and I've attached, um, you know, my livelihood around it. Like that's where I go for Juma and what have you. But um, and I'm open and I'm open. I go do my thing, you know, give salams. Not everyone is like like me. Not what everyone is like Michelle. Not everyone is smiling. Not everyone's life is uh, put together. Some of our lives are falling apart or we're dealing with different things. So when we talk about safe space, we talk about non-judgmental, right? And so uh, if somebody does come half broken or let's say like this Friday, you know, at Juma. I saw someone that was struggling with her salat. I knew she was either new, new, new to Islam or not even Muslim yet. And so I think one of the things we really need to work on is having like, like agents within our masjids, right? People that are um, sensitive to the converts uh, that make sure that they're greeting them, someone at the door that will take care of them. I automatically look around when I get to the to the women's section and I see who's new, who hasn't been there, who I need to greet. Um, and obviously I may miss two, three, four, five because this masjid is really big. But I think we need to collectively come together and think of strategically how can we serve our community better? And one of the elements of that, or one of the aspects is to be very aware of who's coming in those doors and know, know your, your, your client, your customer, right? Know yes. your congregation. And I think that's where we lack of. Obviously there's a lot of people, but we need to build some type of group, like Sister Michelle said, and perhaps the converts can take care of this, right? Where we, because we're, we can easily identify somebody that's struggling, somebody that's probably not dressed appropriately or only to the standards that people are looking for. And so just making sure that, you know, they're taken care of. There was another incident where there was a girl that was definitely praying all completely wrong and aunties were going to about to go attack her. And I was like, whoa, 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 I got her. I will teach her. Um, and so alhamdulillah I was there, but if I wasn't there or someone else was in there, that person will never come back, you know? Um, and so I think that's one of the elements that is missing that special personal touch. Um, and perhaps we can, we can work on that inshallah. Just like so, a low item. So I'm going to ask, after I say this, I'm going to ask uh, uh, first uh, uh, Sister Michelle and Sister Nahila for closing thoughts. And then uh, uh, we're going to have a closing to our brother Abu 
uh, later. Um, so uh, I, I think, as I said before, uh, we've forgotten where we come from, right? Uh, uh, we, we have something that's, uh, in physical, the three R's, uh, that we need to reclaim our roots, right? We, uh, we need to, I mean, reconnect to our roots, the Quran with Sunnah and the per prophetic paradigm. Uh, we need to reclaim the moral and intellectual high ground because Muslims, we've had it over time and different, right? And then we have to recalibrate, right? Recalibrate what we're doing for this place and time. The other part of this is, is that uh, uh, we're teaching a course called Islam in America. And uh, one of my co-teachers, uh, uh, Sheikh uh, um, um, uh, Hamza Abdul Malik, he did a commentary on Surah Kahf, which many of us read every Juma. And, and, and one of the points he makes about this is that it's, it's stories, everybody knows that. But, but, but one of the lessons of the stories is, uh, if you want to transport that into the 21st century, is the different ways of civic engagement are reflected in that Surah, right? Uh, the youth in the cave, right? They betook themselves to the cave, right? al kinder right? It had a different way. Uh, Zul Kif, you know, you, you get, I mean, different ways of engaging, because somehow we think that somehow, and I think this is the point the sisters are making, somehow everybody has to come the same way and deal the same way. And that, and, and, and from this, I extracted three things that we should remember in terms of being engaged. And this is a message both to the converts, reverts, and the people uh, in the Islamic centers is to, to understand that everybody everybody comes from a different context. Everybody has a different level of capability and competence to do what. So you don't send everybody to do everything, and that. But you're always concerned about connections. Islam is about connections, about worldwide connections, family connections, brother and sister connections. I mean, it is about connections. The tarbiyah that our beloved Allah Wasallam he did in Mecca was all about connections. This this ummah is one ummah. Very the end when he talked uh, when he talked in. Uh, and at the farewell sermon, he talked about connections and the family and relationship. Well, he talked about connections. And so to the extent that we're shutting off people because they're women, because they're black, because they're new, uh, if, if, if for any reason, this is a problem. This is really is a problem in that we're not following prophetic paradigm. Okay, so we've gone over time. So we're gonna ask Sister Michelle first, uh, then uh, Sister Mahila to give closing thoughts, and then Brother Abu, Abu Beda, I mispronouncing that, Abu Beda, Sure. Um, I mean, I will just end with this. Project Lena is a labor of love, but also a labor of experience, bringing your whole self to Islam. I suggest any any institution should have this at least in your library so that converts can read it. Um, not just converts. This helps born Muslims. A lot of you have second generations. You're not even sure how to deal with how they're coming up in America, a little different than you came up wherever you're from. I recommend this book, Men and Women Alike. It is um, available at daybreak.robata.org. If you'd like to check out our, our uh, organization as a whole, robata.org, um, we have lots of information there. And I really am so thankful that uh, Tisa has invited us to come together on this again and with Embrace as well. Sister Nahila, it's always a, a pleasure to be with all of you. Um, and I just thank you guys so much. And I hope you guys enjoy the book as much as I did. I went through a conference, read the book, and I'm still, I still like get reminded of things. You know, don't forget who you are. Bring your whole self to Islam because we need you. We need like the ummah needs your all that you've got to give. We, we need it. So um, I encourage you all to run out and get that when you can. Sister Mahila. Thank you, Sister Michelle. Always a pleasure to be here with both of you. And we hope that Embrace is my little flyer. We hope at Embrace, inshallah, that we continue to collaborate and partner up together um, and truly welcome one another with love, compassion, and dignity and respect, which is what every human being on this planet is looking for. And so we want to welcome everyone, whether you're in the DFW area, we have weekly uh, in-person and hybrid um, halakas happening. Uh, we have six chapters around the country and we are growing very rapidly, alhamdulillah. Uh, the other thing is that our sister's halakha, actually, I do have my Lena book because we are going to start Lena. And this is, I just want to, I just want to share this with all of you. This is what collaboration truly looks like. 
if Rabata has something that we don't have, we will take on and grow on it, grow off of it, right? And so the same thing with TISA and, and so on and so forth. And I think that's what our leadership and our masajids need to really understand what true collaboration and alliance looks like. And so here are three converts from three different walks of life from three generations, Allah uh, who are coming together for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we hope that you look into embrace at embracereverts.org. Uh, if you need brotherhood, sisterhood, we're here for you, inshallah. Uh, Jazakallah hair, Dr. Jimmy Jones, for inviting us. It's always a pleasure to be in your presence and honor, and Tisa and Rabata. Jazakallah hair. Alhamdulillah. Before you, uh, the closing door, I, my colleagues would, would, would will jump on me if I don't say that we have jobs at Tisa. So if you want to work on this project, uh, just go to our website, islamicseminary.us. We have a couple of jobs uh, you might be interested in, and we're going to be hiring an operations person pretty soon, inshallah. So please join us in this journey. Brother uh, uh, Abu Beda uh, will close out as a representative of Sufa uh, uh, Islamic Seminary. And thank you, Brother Abu Beda, for providing the opportunity and support uh, for doing this. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Inshallah, we'll make a dua, short dua. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Maliki, Yawmiddin, Iyaka Na'abudu wa Iyaka Nasta'in. Ihdina Sifat al-Mustaqeem, Sirat al-Ladheena An'amu Alayhim, Ghayri al-Maghdubi Alayhim, Wa Ladhaalim. Ameen. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruk wa natubu ilayk. Wa al-Asr, inna al-Insana lafi khus. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين praise be to Allah and we ask Allah سبحانه وتعالى to accept all of your deeds and to إن شاء الله to give blessing to all these projects to forward it آمين إن شاء الله نزاكم الله خير بارك الله فيك سلام عليكم to all of you and to all of our viewers, thank you very much. Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.